welcome everybody. I think, you know, we, um, I'm, I'm really very happy and on behalf of the university, Anand National University, I have to congratulate the Sustainability Center led by Minya and uh, Dhawal, Zikran and uh, everyone else in the team. What we have managed to demonstrate here is uh, uh, what perhaps, you know, each university uh, would strive to do or strives to do, which is to put research, curiosity and all the discoveries that you make and, and uh, ideas that you would have into practice, you know, into a kind of practice that makes tremendous impact. And I think uh, this research on vacant housing that Sustainability Center has uh, come up with, uh, and, and I was so impressed with it, you know, so a year back when uh, I first saw it, and um, we had uh, these thoughts about, you know, so putting all these findings into action, you know, so somehow if we could just manage to get even a certain percentage of 7.5% of vacant houses um, into use uh, for, for so many people out there, you know, who have uh, no roof over their heads. And uh, then a few months later, you know, we were hit by the pandemic. And um, then, you know, so this data that we had, this information that we had, um, you know, just came alive in a way. And we had um, a discussion and uh, Mania's team had come up with this idea, this number that, you know, we might be a little smug about uh, our belief that we would be able to handle, you know, the numbers of those infected, you know, say, and everything would be controlled. But uh, it was becoming evident that, you know, so the number of those infected would really, you know, overtake uh, the number of beds that government had uh, or, or, or uh, the civic society had uh, in place for us. And, and there, there was something which uh, was very urgently required, you know, so we needed more space, we needed more beds, we needed more facilities um, to take care of those um, who would be in the early stages of um, infection. And that is when, you know, so the penny dropped and um, the center started working and uh, really working overtime, connecting with um, a variety of stakeholders, you know, and uh, the idea was very simple. If we could just use even a fraction of the vacant houses available across the country to turn them into recovery centers, to furnish, you know, say these uh, uh, spaces with um, furniture that would be cheap, that would be useful, that would be sturdy enough, and, and uh, hygienic. Um, so we started, you know, um, our discussion with governments, with corporate houses, you know, seeking permission um, to turn these spaces into such recovery centers. And I'm happy to tell you that, you know, uh, the effort put in by uh, the center led to cooperation, permission from the government at the center, at the state level, at uh, uh, the regional level, you know, and, and uh, plenty of corporate houses, you know, say, which came um, to our help, to our aid, you know, say, for this particular plan, for this innovation. And um, as of today, I think, you know, say, we have uh, more than 1,500 beds in uh, nine hospitals across five states. And this is something that just one university led by one center, sustainable, sustainability center, combining the fruits of research with innovation and, uh, you know, invention. This is what it has managed to do. This is how it has reached out uh, and, and met a threat head on. And I just hope that it, it, it turns into an example. We have a report now that's ready to be launched. And of course, with all the experts here, I'm sure that, you know, uh, it will be disseminated further and we'll get more ideas, we'll get more support. Um, and and uh, thank you all for being here. And I'm really excited by, you know, say this endeavor, this project that has been undertaken. And I'm sure uh, even without any pandemic, you know, so what we have managed to do here is set an example about how educational institution, how research and how practice and, and uh, a, a range of collaborators, you know, say if we come together, things could actually, problems could be solved. And, and um, lots of examples could be set and uh, of inspirational nature. We need inspiration, such are the times. 
And um, thank you, Professor Chatterjee. Thank you, Minya. Thank you, Daval, and, and the team for having inspired us. Best wishes. Thank you, Anunaya. Your support in this whole endeavor was very, very, uh, you know, motivational for, I think, everyone. And we could go out and do a, a lot in this short time frame. Uh, I'd just like to take some time to discuss that, uh, give a bit of context about this uh, report uh, that we are releasing today. I think people are uh, aware that, you know, we hear it all the time that India faces a huge housing shortage. Uh, but, but we sometimes also need, uh, tend to, you know, not realize how severe it is. The numbers out there say that uh, we need somewhere close to 18, 19 million homes in urban India. Uh, but when you look at it, that, that number is increasing by nearly 10% year on year because India is facing one of the largest waves of rural to urban migration in terms of volume that has ever hit the world. So uh, whereas, uh, you know, in the 1800s, 1900s, when we saw urbanization, the, the, ru the rural to uh, urban migration was happening to more affluent cities. But now it is happening in poorer countries. And it never happened at this volume. So uh, the housing shortage, uh, we have been woefully uh, unable to cope with it. And we uh, going through this, we realized that there is this huge volume of houses, seven and a half percent of all urban housing stock in India lies vacant. But when you break it down, you find that the numbers are even more startling in certain cities. Uh, for example, Bombay, uh, Maharashtra has a 17% vacancy and uh, uh, Gujarat, Ahmedabad in particular, has around 14.5%. So 14.5% actually translates to 170,000 homes. So, and that's a, that's a huge amount, you know, in any way I put it, because these are just uh, our survey and all of this is focused on the low cost and low middle income homes. This is not even considering the higher income homes that are on the market. So, uh, uh, so, you know, we are, we are dealing with very, very large numbers here. And we were quite surprised when we went through this primary survey, uh, looking at secondary data with some of the findings that we came up with. I'll just share the screen right now before I uh, go ahead with uh, uh, the rest of the work. So this is, this is a very uh, brief, uh, you know, uh, reasons that we came up with. But what we found that uh, when we talk about vacancy, A, there is a structural vacancy in India. Uh, and that, that's a problem that, uh, that is across, across the country, across markets. And then you have a lot of regional angles that are very, very local and pertinent to, if not a state, if not a, a city, then at least a state or a region. We did... Uh, in this, uh, you know, when we came up with the data, trying to analyze it, we, we tried to do it in a, a lot of different ways to, you know, try to get insights and some very, very important insights that we came up with that, uh, you know, Ahmedabad, uh, the city that we took up uh, for our first uh, survey, uh, there's, a very, there's a very distinct uh, regional uh, geographic divide, east and west side of the city, which is along the river Sabarmati. And in, uh, in the report, in the surveys, we made a conscious effort not only to look at these angles, but also separate uh, private developments and government developments. Because at present in India, the government remains the largest supplier of low-cost housing at present. Over the last six years, nearly 3.7 million homes have been delivered and a further 10 million are under planning. So, uh, so you know, that was a very, very important point. And... Uh, you would expect that because the government is delivering homes to the people most in need uh, and there is there is so much of uh, demand, there's so much of slum, like, you know, I think the slum population is somewhere between 10% to 12%. Uh, you would see no vacancy, but it was, it was very, very startling to see that as compared to uh, private developments, uh, government developments saw a much, much higher level of vacancy. Uh, and that puts into question that, you know, the whole process. Uh, also, we found that the eastern part of the city, 
which is uh, in some ways the poorer part, which is in some ways more polarized, uh, which has a lot of uh, uh, industrial development, uh, saw a very, very high amount of vacancy, you know, closer to on an average 20%. While we came to the uh, Western part, uh, it fell and some parts hardly had any vacancy. But when we drilled a bit deeper into the government vacancy, because that was a very startling number, we found that a lot of what, lot of it was due to documentation. Now, this was in cases that people had not uh, fulfilled the minimum criteria or going through loans. And that's very surprising because that number was nearly 20, 23%, you know, so nearly one fourth. The second uh, reason we found is uh, in, in all the projects that were government owned, owner occupation was below, uh, was quite low. Uh, you know, below 50% virtually in all cases. Uh, and that, that, that was, that was, uh, that was something that was very intriguing. And when we further broke down the numbers, we found that the rental, uh, rental occupancy in government buildings is much higher. Now that, that leads us to two uh, sort of uh, conclusions or inferences, which is that a lot of these homes are occupied uh, not by people that they were intended for, who are the owners. Uh, you know, investors have come in who could otherwise afford different homes, but they have somehow gamed the system and got it. And the other thing is that the method of delivery. So the government has a lottery system and you do you most of the times you don't have control over where you are allotted your home. So uh, people might be allotted homes in areas which are further away from their uh, places of work. Maybe, you know, there's uh, children's schools and some of which which they cannot move from. Now, uh, in this case, they have no other option to continue to live in slums or on rent and other areas and either rent out their homes or keep them vacant, um, which is again a financial burden of the, on them. So uh, those were the two most startling uh, sort of insights that we gained. Second thing we also realized is that in Ahmedabad, uh, you know, Ahmedabad, Gujarat overall is a, is a very mercantile state. And Ahmedabad has always been a very uh, uh, commerce driven city. So you always had representatives of, uh, you know, groups of a lot of religions. And due to the laws that existed at a time, a lot of development that happened was through a cooperative structure. Now, what that led to was a very homogenization of uh, people of a particular, uh, uh, how would I say, uh, ethnic group or religion or habits uh, inhabiting uh, a housing development. And because of that, those housing developments tended to be more in demand, uh, more prestigious. Now we found that uh, there, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of friction in Ahmedabad uh, when it came to, came to more mixed developments. So that was one thing we saw very, very strongly and particularly, you know, very surprising on the uh, vegetarian, non-vegetarian food divide, which I think it exists in very few other areas. So that was a very, very local problem. I don't think it exists at this scale in virtually any other uh, 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 large urban uh, agglomeration in India. Uh, one other thing that came to mind, the other reason for vacancy that we realized is that a lot of houses were built were ready to occupy, but unsold. And that inventory was huge. So uh, we dug deeper. Now, uh, before two, three years, uh, India overall has gone through a tremendous real estate boom, starting, I think uh, you would say around 2000. And that went on till 2015, 16. Now, what that meant is that though it uh, saw a construction at an unprecedented rate, but that uh, drove up uh, land prices dramatically. Now, uh, because of that, there is a huge disconnect right now in Ahmedabad at the price where housing is available, what we would call affordable, which caters to in Indian parlance as the economically weaker section or low income group or lower middle income group and what at what price it is available in the market. Uh, and that has led through a lot of stress in the financial system as well. So. Uh, you know, uh, that was a completely different uh, sort of a problem that exists in parallel 
to the problem of uh, apartments being sold and not occupied. So we found these two broad buckets uh, which are uh, of concern. And the biggest reason for uh, 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 for vacancy in uh, uh, for vacancy uh, in this space is actually the high price and at times uh, to to compensate for that when builders have gone much further away from the city centers uh, that uh, th that is where a lot of the un unsold stock lies. so with that I'll hand it over back to Minia uh, uh, to take it ahead Minya? Thank you, Thawal. Yeah, yeah. just my thing was mute. Thank you so much, Thawal, and uh, thank you, Dr. Chaube. Um, you know, without your support and uh, guidance all through uh, everything that we've been able to achieve, uh, both in terms of research as well as implementing the research, would clearly not have been possible. Um, and thank you to all those who have joined us today in the webinar. I see several participants on the webinar, as well as I took a look on Facebook Live. We have close to about 150 people watching there. Thank you so much for taking out the time to um, discuss this important uh, topic. Um, and, um, um, you know, we're talking here about uh, the paradox of houses that are lying vacant in India. So 7.5% uh, of residential uh, stocks of houses are lying vacant in India. And on the other hand, we have close to about 200 million people who are homeless. Uh, in uh, Gujarat itself, the housing shortage is uh, close to a million. And uh, whereas about 170,000 homes uh, were found uh, vacant. Um, and uh, double, this was in Ahmedabad itself, right? Yes, yes. 170,000 plus in Ahmedabad. Itself. In Ahmedabad itself. So you can imagine the gravity of the situation. And that my team, what we were thinking about is that uh, how, what can we do to um, overcome this gap, uh, this housing gap, on where on one hand there are houses that are lying vacant and on the other hand uh, there are people who need houses. So here we are today with a research report on Ahmedabad. Uh, just wanted to share with everybody that uh, the Cent Anand Center for Sustainability will be doing a city series of reports. Each time we will be deep diving into one specific city. We're starting with Ahmedabad, our home city. Next would be Mumbai. Um, and and so on. Um, I would like to, without any further ado, I would like to welcome the panelists on today's uh, discussion. These are all um, experts in specific uh, fields and uh, um, I'm very excited to bring everybody together in what would I think be a very interesting and, um, um, and uh, useful uh, discussion for moving on to implementing some of the solutions which have come out in this report. Um, we, have, uh, uh, we have David Smith. Um, he is the founder or, and CEO of the Affordable Housing Institute in Boston, and uh, which, as the name suggests, uh, develops a sustainable housing financial ecosystems worldwide. Um, and um, he, uh, he's a Harvard graduate. He's an award-winning author, which is uh, very interesting. Um, he also has an influential blog. And maybe, um, David, you could maybe just put the, type out the name of your blog for all those who would be maybe interested in knowing more on, on affordable housing. Uh, David is also the founder and chairman of Recap Real Estate Advisors, which is a Boston-based firm that specializes in uh, complex multifamily asset problems. Welcome, David. Thank you for uh, taking the time out to join this discussion. Anil Anthony, um, he, uh, he's a young politician. He uh, manages uh, the Indian National Congress's national social media. And uh, really interestingly, he also brought together a fabulous community um, of innovators, uh, members of parliament from across different parties, uh, funders. Uh, he brought them together and he created something called um, the Parliamentarians with Innovators for India, which has been very active in deploying solutions for uh, fighting COVID uh, during these times. And Anil and uh, Parliamentarians for Innovators of India, where I'm also a mentor uh, to that organization, uh, was a major partner in, um, you know, in some of the, for, for um, carrying out some of the work that Anunaya mentioned, um, where we built 
uh, where we built uh, COVID hospitals within uh, vacant homes. Yeah, so thank you, Anil, um, and welcome to the discussion. Um, Zishan, Zishan is uh, assistant professor and a senior researcher at the Anand Center for Sustainability. Uh, he's an economist um, and he's been a very uh, important, uh, he's played a very important part in uh, putting together the research and the, uh, for the report that we'll be discussing today. Thank you, Zishan. Um, and Havel, um, you know, who just presented the report, um, you know, he uh, is uh, associate professor at uh, Anand National University and also the director of affordable housing at the university. Besides that, he is also a, a, a prominent uh, uh, builder uh, and an expert at affordable housing. He's a founder and managing director of First Home Reality Solutions Private Limited, which have implemented several projects for affordable housing in partnership uh, with. The, the private sector. Uh, so thank you, Dhawal. Thank you for all your efforts and the report. Thank you for presenting. And uh, can I now? Can I just start this uh, uh, this conversation, this discussion with you again, Dhawal? Um, you uh, went into some of the reasons uh, for houses lying vacant um, and uh, in Ahmedabad, especially. Uh, what would be you know, so what would be, some, if you extrapolate uh, from our findings in Ahmedabad, would, what would be some of, the, some of the reasons why houses are lying vacant in India, in other cities and other states from your experience? So, Minya, uh, there were two major structural reasons that we've seen that why houses are vacant. So, traditionally, um, uh, real estate has been a preferred source of investment for Indians. Uh, because our uh, investments in uh, capital markets uh, overall are one of the lowest in the world. So, you know, it's always been a way where people have invested money in and it's always been a sector where a lot of uh, black money or cash has found a shelter. Now, if we look at rental yields in India, they lie anywhere between 1 to 3%. 3% is very optimistic. And where our risk-free rate rises at somewhere between around 7%. So, you know, at times it... Uh, is just not worth your while to actually rent out a house because you would spend nearly 1% on its upkeep every year. So uh, apart from that, uh, second reason is that our eviction laws have traditionally been very, very lax and favoring the uh, renters. So people are still very scared to actually rent out their homes because A, there is no financial return. Uh, rental incomes are taxed very heavily at uh, 33% and uh, eviction is a problem. So, you know, there is no structural incentive for people to rent in India. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Zishan, um, could, can I bring you in here? And, um, you know, we did this research on vacant houses in Ahmedabad. And going forward, uh, the team plans to do research across different cities. Would you like to share um, the methodology of how we went about doing this research? Because clearly it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very problematic, right? We're trying to look at, we're trying to find out why uh, houses are lying vacant and the person who would actually have this answer, which is the owner of the house, is absent, is yeah. missing. So yeah. how do you even carry out, um, you know, um, how do you gather primary data in such a complicated, in such a difficult pro you know, problem? Uh, maybe in, in a very few words, you could just mention how did we go about doing this in Ahmedabad? What are the plans of doing the same thing in other cities? Yes, Minya, you rightly mentioned that it was a challenging task of this study because it is very difficult to trace the owners of the house. Yeah. That is why we used the focus group discussion technique of survey, which typically involves a moderate-led group discussion uh, uh, with the, between 8 to 10 participants. And these particip participants were likely to share similar demographic and circumstances and buying behaviors. So when it comes to the delivering a quantitative, qualitative research, uh, focus groups are widely considered by researchers uh, to be one of the most effective tools. So we planned a group discussion among uh, participants led by a group of students from uh, Anand National University in pilot survey, and then by the professional moderators who created a natural environment and provided us uh, uh, a window into the owner's head. So in a group discussion, what happened actually, uh, different opinions and perspectives emerged, uh, all of which combined to paint a detailed picture for the, for the major reasons of uh, vacant houses. And I personally believe 
that uh, the dynamics of the focus group uh, can have a huge uh, positive influence on the quality of the research output. In some instances, uh, these uh, discussion uh, uh, can produce new thinking among the particip participants, uh, which could result in much more in-depth discussion. Uh, this kind of uh, dynamic discussion, you know, uh, also allows group participants to easily share their opinions, whether they are uh, agreeing or they disagreeing. So, as you mentioned, the information on uh, reasons uh, for the vacant houses cannot be gathered from the house owners. Therefore, uh, we focused on the representatives of the own, uh, owners' associations, other residents in the same apartment, and also from the property agents in that particular area. Using the brokers, the third, as, well. brokers yeah. as well. We went across the city looking, you know, interviewing several brokers as well. Yeah, yeah. And using uh, structured and semi structured questionnaires to collect. Uh, both qualitative as well as the quantitative data. And once we had that uh, quality data, uh, we tried to explore different uh, research uh, questions using different uh, statistical methods, such as uh, to examine the determining factors of vacant houses. We used a multiple linear regression model. While when uh, we wanted to analyze the relationship between the uh, rate of uh, vacant houses with the uh, convenient uh, accessibilities of various uh, amenities, uh, we used a pairwise correlation matrix, which summarizes the association between two continuous variables uh, from minus one to uh, plus one scale. Similarly, if we wanted to understand the questions like, is there any relationship between the increasing value of houses and uh, the number of vacant houses? We try to measure the present value of the house and the value of the same house three years ago. Then we calculated the growth of value appreciation uh, for, for three years and we classified that uh, value of appreciation in five different quantiles uh, like the first quartile refers to the least uh, appreciation while the fifth qu quantile uh, represents the highest appreciation so of course uh, the it was a challenging because the main uh, owner of uh, that particular house is not available but yeah this is the very acceptable uh, okay. approach uh, that that we have adopted to do to do our research. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Zishan. Thank you so much. I just wanted to mention that you know the floor is open for questions and answers. So there is a Q and A button at the, on the bottom of the webinar that you're watching. So please feel free. Uh, we have 42 participants and about 200 on Facebook Live. So please feel free to bring in your questions. Uh, I'll be taking those questions from the chat box. Yeah, David, um, you know, um, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been very curious to know from you. You've got about 40 years, more than 40 years of experience in the space. What have you seen in other countries? Havel uh, and Zishan, they talked about some of the reasons for and how we figured out the reasons of vacant houses in uh, Ahmedabad. We plan to do so in the rest of India. Any, any um, um, uh, observations of reasons uh, which might be contrasting or similar uh, in, uh, for vacant houses in other countries? Right. I should mention that in addition to my advanced years and focus exclusively on my obsessive subject, I'm not completely unfamiliar with India. We have done a bunch of work in India for the World Bank and others. And we were a founding investor in an Indian housing microfinance company called Seva Rin, now known as Sitara, which started out in Ahmedabad. And I have been to Ahmedabad a number of times. And my wife's been to the Calico Museum and the Stepwells and had a wonderful experience. So I'm not entirely conceptless with respect to that. I start actually from, I'm going to invert your question. I almost think the issue is less how many homes are vacant and more how many households are unhoused, underhoused, or unacceptably housed, meaning it's too expensive or it's substandard. Reason I ask that is because there is always an equilibrium structural vacancy in the marketplace. In the United States, for example, 8.5% of all the homes in America are vacant all, in equilibrium state. There are 140 million 500,000 homes in the United States and about 128,600,000 households, as far as we know. That's counting formal ones. And the equilibrium state arises for a number of reasons. One of them, Deval made reference to early on, people move around, rural to urban migration. Um, you also have the problem of substandard housing, housing that falls out of the inventory. So you want to think about that, and you want to think, by contrast, about 
disruptive changes in vacancy and occupancy. You made reference to COVID, you made reference to the shutdown, um, and of course, before COVID, we had the phenomenon of, of excessive development. Again, Duval made reference to people parking or laundering black money, the idea that if you have less confidence in the currency, you wanna put it into property because property holds its value. All of those phenomena mania are global. They occur in every single country. And the challenge, challenges facing you all are really very similar. The challenge of driving new production to where the jobs are coming to with stranded cost housing from where the jobs have left from. The other challenge, two other challenges that you face not to lose sight of. The first one is as a country becomes more affluent, household size gets smaller. So you wanna keep track, not just of growth of population, but the changing size of households. And the second phenomenon, our current big initiative here at AHI is around the phrase health secure housing. Housing is now a much more important asset class than it was six months ago. So many more people are working from home. It used to be, in India, you have a large number of informal people who work from home. Now in America, we have a large number of formal people who work from home. When the home becomes the workplace, and the home is the place where kids learn, and the home is the place where webinars are held and webinars are viewed, then you have infrastructure upgrades that are essential to making homes healthy. So as you think about your study and as you think about taking it forward, the case example that you talked about before of converting the, uh, empty dwellings into COVID and recovery housing, there's gonna be a lot more of that. There's gonna be a lot more of repurposing of stranded inventory. So Zishan, as you're looking for vacant property, I would be looking for vacant shopping malls. I would be looking for stranded costs in schools. I will tell you, the shopping mall in the United States is, is on its way to being dead. And, P, and studies are being done to repurpose them into integrated live work, health secure housing because you control a large building envelope. So in answer to your question, I, I'm really I'm actually am impressed with, with India's slum upgrading strategy, Arogya said to the use of apps and generation skipping technology to, to contract, contact tracing and stuff like that. And I think you have a real opportunity to take advantage of all the spectacular brain power and IT capacity to reinvent the city in light of the fact that you're going to need to evolve what is housing and what is the quality of housing. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, and thank you for pointing out that the problem is not vacant houses. It's, it's the fact that on one hand you have vacant houses and then there is homelessness or inadequate housing. The problem is this paradox. Thank you. Um, Anil, uh, this is a perfect bridge into uh, what I've been wanting to speak with you about. You know, we've done a ton of work together on building COVID hospitals across India and vacant buildings. Uh, but then from your experience as, uh, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're part of politics, you have your own not-for-profit. Um, you hail from Kerala, where, where there have been floods and, you know, and uh, a lot of natural uh, disasters. How else can we repurpose some of these vacant buildings and moving beyond vacant homes, but vacant malls, vacant uh, office spaces that might be lying around? What are the other ways of repurposing some of this vacant infrastructure that uh, you can think of? Um. Uh, so thank you, Minya. First of all, thank you for uh, following me for this um, wonderful discussion. Um, uh, so unlike many of the others who are in the webinar, like I'm not a domain expert in the housing space, like I work in the um, social sector and the technology space. Um, but like Minya had already pointed out, like I am a part of an organization called Parliamentarians with Innovators for India. Uh, we focus on innovations. We are a COVID-19 response and action group. And one of the projects that we have been doing was a um, project with Anand University where many and Tawal and all were involved in even many other people I haven't met. And we were converting uh, vacant spaces into COVID-19 recovery centers. It was a very fine example of how uh, the private sector, the government sector, the uh, many NGOs and corporate sector, all of us could come together to use a resource which was lying vacant. Uh, I also come from Kerala where um, unfortunately in the last three years, whenever there was a heavy monsoon, like it has been an annual thing, where whenever there was a 
uh, now there are heavy rains like floods have become inevitable and then the last three years like my NGO had been actively involved in um, rescue and relief operations there and I have been seeing many of these vacant facilities that are lying there which are being used as uh, relief centers. Uh, so that is some of the experiences I had so far. Uh, David, uh, had, uh, before I spoke, David did uh, mention some of the uh, trends that are happening in the sector and I'll just chip on with some other things that I noticed which I, I think um, could help to drive the discussion. Uh, so uh, one of them is uh, like, like the report already says, like uh, almost 20% um, uh, of our, like almost 20 million people, uh, houses are required in India. That is what the studies say. Um, but uh, like, um, I'll just uh, want to bring a couple of points there. One of them is I, uh, uh, like, I work in the social sector and I've been seeing something which is rapid urbanization that has been happening in the last few years. Uh, last year, one of my um, friends who is working in the, he's a developmental economist and I did read one of those reports. And last year was one of those, um, one of those decisive years where a huge swing happened as far as India's demographics was concerned. Because uh, for the first time ever, like last year was the first time when the number of people in urban India were actually more than rural India. Because the population of our country actually crossed 50% in urban India last year. And uh, uh, despite a lot of people who are coming from many of these rural places, um, and they are finding places to live in many of these cities also. But something which I have noticed is, even though technically they have a place to stay and even though they are not really homeless, the living conditions they live in, is uh, the conditions they are living in is actually like, pretty, like, I wouldn't say they are even the most humane of conditions where you have small rooms, like one, like few square meter rooms where you have 10 and 15 people who are staying in, like in cramped areas. We have many of our uh, slum areas where you yourself worked during the COVID times in Taravi, etc., where things are very similar. So even though we say that the number of homes that are required is only 20 million, to be very honest, I personally think that the actual number will be way higher. Uh, like according to 2011 census, I believe that uh, uh, currently they have classified uh, us to have around 80 million houses. And they say that we need 20 million more, but the actual requirement would be a lot more. Uh, then something else that I feel Again, uh, this is some of the trends that is happening. And that is, uh, in the last uh, few years, e-governance has been growing substantially in most of the uh, states. And uh, like now almost all our land records, all our housing records, etc., are being digitized uh, drastically. Um, so just in the last 10 years, like the state I am from Kerala, like almost 100% of our houses, etc., are now being digitized and recorded. Uh, so that is a trend that is happening. Plus, uh, overall, uh, this is a time where I would say, like, uh, this is a time where we are seeing a lot of shared. This is uh, the time of like, uh, like I could say that this is a shared economy. Where if you look at some of our biggest uh, firms, like let's say from Uber to Airbnb to even NetJets to uh, let's say even cloud computing, etc., we are seeing this trend of us accumulating a lot of sparse resources and trying to gain economic uh, value out of it. So this is also something which I'm sure uh, will get more visible even in India. And sooner than later, like a lot of these unused facilities would be, uh, I would say they can be used in a more efficient manner by getting um, more participatory involvement. So this is something else which is happening. So these are some of the trends. Um, and Thank I think you. Th thanks, Anil. And uh, thanks for bringing the point back to what David also mentioned that, uh, you know, the numbers are one about the homeless people, but there's also, there's a huge chunk of inadequate housing and that also needs to be 
you know, counted for. Uh, and also in our findings uh, where, with the, you know, in our report, we, we did come across several housing societies uh, where uh, some of our researchers, you know, the primary survey was one done by the students and thereafter it was the research team at the center. And we would go to these housing societies and the guard would say that, no, no, you know, this is not, it's not safe for people to enter. And uh, it's typically those societies are crowded, overcrowded, a lot of illegal activities happening over there, uh, high levels of alcoholism um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I want to, ha you know, just ask the panelists an open question, whoever wants to take this up, that um, there is a change in lifestyle that we are seeing, which Anil also mentioned, right? The shared economy, we're moving towards sharing offices. There are also people who live across different cities. I live in Goa where half the houses are empty here because people come over to my little village um, and use the houses here as holiday homes. Uh, or there are urban nomads, uh, people who live across different countries uh, in the same year. Um, there are also people who live, you know, they are constantly on the move and caravans and so on and so forth. So there is a change in lifestyle, which uh, I feel also adds up to the vacant stock in housing and especially in the cities, in the big cities. Um, any comments on this? Um, and why I'm asking you this is because uh, I feel that the, there is a policy lag there because the housing policies that we have today, uh, at least in India, they are not yet tailored for this kind of shift in lifestyle in uh, in metropolitan in in, the, in, met, in metropolitans. Uh, who, anybody who wants to take on this question. Yeah, David, go ahead. Kids need a place to go to school. And they need stability in their neighborhood environment. So that most countries, when they're developing a national housing policy, try to anchor it around the puka house for a family to expand and have more children and give those kids a stable environment to grow up. And that becomes, if you will, the, the anchor tenure model for home ownership. That's what most housing policy in most countries, including the United States, is built around. What you described, Minya, are three or four different adjacent household types, people who are young and don't have kids, where mobility is a big deal people who are quite successful and have uh, an internet-based or an information-based uh, earnings model where you want to alternate between the two nice places at different times of the year. Um, and, and then the third part, and Anil made reference to this in the repurposing of structures, I think we're going to, I, I think the unit to keep your eye on is to shorten the daily commute, reduce it in time and in distance and in number of what I call wet encounters, which is an opportunity for me to breathe on you or you to breathe on me. That leads you to repurposing with live workspace, shared office space. I think some of these office towers will turn into combinations of office and residential. Um, I, and last point, Mina, you made that's really good. In housing, when you look at housing, you're looking into the past because every home was built based on somebody's conception of what a family was when the home was built. And that conception changes. And when you look at housing policy and housing law, you're looking far into the past. I don't have to tell you that you have laws on the books since the Raj that still affect land use and land occupancy. So when you're trying to make change, the easy thing to do is envision it and CAD cam it. The second easy thing to do is to pour the cement. The harder things to do are to change the laws <clears throat> and to change the existing built environment. So I, 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 will, I will give a plug for Anand University here. I think what you folks are trying to do with your university and your sustainability center and an integrated practicum to explore how we make the future, I think that's very cool stuff. And the more that it can be cross-disciplinary, 
to bring the architects and the app designers and the future of work people and the cement contractors and the community groups, bring that all together, you have an opportunity to do a generation skipping model of the technology of the city and the technology of 21st century economic and healthy social life. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, in fact, proximity from school and proximity from workplace. Uh, this came up again and again when, in our survey as well. Um, and uh, because we focused our, our research on uh, the EWS, the economically weaker section and the lower income groups, often what happens is these building projects, they are made you know, at, at the further end of the city on the periphery to lower the costs of the housing, but that um, that's a destroys the economics and the community of the people for whom it is intended to serve. They're lying vacant because who's going that's to correct. Do, yeah, where, where are the jobs uh, at the it, it, and, and if it's any consolation, which it probably isn't, China has done this a hundred times and not learned a lesson. Brazil did it around the Olympics and the World Cup. Uh, Turkey has been busily trying to do it by taking people out of downtown Istanbul and, and Ankara and moving them 25 and 30 kilometers away to isolated high-rise blocks. It is the natural habit uh, of short thinking, let's build units, quantified scorekeeping housing production. Absolutely. And it's bad housing policy and it's bad for the people. And I, and I will not stand in India where you have a very educated and active populace. Thank you. Thanks. Dhawal, would you like to have, make a quick comment on location, design, infrastructure of uh, affordable housing, um, what, we, what we saw in our research? Would you like to make a yes. comment on that? So uh, the biggest challenge with uh, location in India has been lack of public transport. So if you see where we've seen suburbs developing successfully is in India, you have only one example is Bombay. Bombay maybe has one of the best public transport systems in the world. And so you have seen, in spite of having a very, very limited land mass, the, uh, uh, the amount of population it supports is just humongous. So when we tried, when India tried to replicate it in other cities going further away, it has uh, flopped miserably. And we see it all around. You know, there are so many cases. Second thing is that, uh, you know, a lot of this, like David said, is a lot of scorekeeping. So... Uh, like India is not one country, you know, but it's like, you know, it's, it's very, very different. If uh, Minya lives in Goa and uh, it, it's, it's tropical and, you know, uh, let's say Kerala. Kerala is just like maybe a Pacific island. And the, the, the lifestyle and the designing is completely different from what you would do up in the Himalayas or in Gujarat. But we see a very, very homogeneous design and building type being proposed across the country. And that has led also to a lot of vacancy. And this is a bit anecdotal, but uh, when I was do when I when I started uh, with my with my company and the first sort of projects, we actually encountered so many government housing, which was in urban Pune and even in Bombay that was just abandoned in uh, in places like Rajasthan, because you know people had uh, livestock that they had to keep, and uh, how do you do it in a nine-story building? Many um, where the lifts don't work. So uh, kind of that's what has been fundamentally missing in our case. And just to quickly address the point that Minya raised about, uh, you know, this different type of housing. Uh, our, uh, you know, we face uh, two very distinct challenges in India. When we go lower down the order, uh, it's, it's actually not housing, it's shelter, like I would like to term it. And those people don't have any choice, nor do they have uh, a lot of options. So, you know, uh, a policy for them is very different from designing a policy for the middle class. I think the middle class with a little bit of uh, liberal support by the government to the private sector, you could see shared ownership and, you know, swappable homes. And that's, that's something that I have started teaching in my classes, uh, becoming a real possibility. But we need a very robust policy for anybody who can't afford a home, which is priced more than 2 million rupees. Yeah, thank you. And with that, I'll move on to solutions. I think uh, it's been a really rich discussion, um, you know, for, uh, on Ahmedabad, India, David bringing in some of the global uh, trends, which are very similar that we're seeing in India, Anil bringing the social angle um, as well. Uh, thank you. And moving on to solutions, um, you know, what we've seen is that on one hand, we have uh, a few 
structural solutions which are applicable you know at a country level policy level um, you know at the policy level across the country and on the other hand uh, we felt that every city had its own very local reasons why houses are vacant and why there are people you know who need housing um, and, uh, and and this is why we're looking at city by city and going city by city and doing these reports as well. Um, Dhaval, would you like to talk about some of the solutions, some of the key solutions, like if you were to name maybe uh, the top five solutions very quickly that, you know, we've put forth uh, in our report, what would they be? So uh, we, we, you know, after looking at all this, we decided that we'll first look at structural solutions. Uh, both for uh, houses that are vacant with developers and houses that are unoccupied. So for rental, it's it's a big deal. You know, you it's very difficult to bridge the divide from three percent to seven percent and possibly you know twelve percent. It's like you know how do you increase uh, uh, rental by four times? Uh, people's incomes are not going to go up four times, and neither are prices going to drop to twenty five percent. So uh, we thought that we need to uh, think a little out of the box. So India has long been following uh, something called tax exemption under a section called ATIBA. So if for rental properties, if they could, uh, you know, bring in a similar uh, uh, provision, but at an individual level rather than a, a level of a company, uh, we make it possible uh, for people to actually, you know, if somebody wants to set up rental housing residential at, a, uh, at an institutional level, to give them access to priority sector lending, but priority sector lending directly, not through banks. Because if you borrow through banks, you still get it at eight, nine percent. But uh, the direct rate is two percent. If they could work out a way, which is part of the affordable housing uh, migrant rental policy, but uh, not completely. Third, it would be very interesting to see if they, they, if you know, the government came up that you know, if there is any building which is an FSI of four or two. And if whatever rental housing you build on top of it is FSI free, so it's just the cost of construction takes away the cost of land, you might actually realize that, you know, it, it starts making sense after that, because, uh, you know, you, you take away a very large part of it. So rental will need a very, very creative solution because the divide is just the chasm is too high. Um, the second was, how do you uh, get developers? to sell the houses which they have built and are unoccupied at maybe a 20, 30% discount because yeah. the unsold inventory is yeah, in a bucket because that's a very, very large inventory across the country. And uh, this is something that will, uh, th that needs to be done. You know, it'll go a long way. Uh, so for that, what we suggested that they could easily bring in the tax exemption in a retrospective way, they could actually incentivize them that, you know, if let's say 50% of your homes are unsold, Will it give you free FSI for your next project if you cut the prices by X, Y, Z? Uh, you know, give exemption from stamp duty. Now we model this in, in, I think there's a question about that as well. We actually model this and we realize that by doing all of this, the government could help developers reduce prices by nearly 20, 25%. Uh, now, uh, what the government loses is only <laughs> revenue that, sorry, sorry. Uh, is uh, uh, revenue uh, that they, uh, revenue that uh, that the government would have earned. It's not anything is not going directly out of their pockets. So even as a you know medium term measure, it could prove very good. The third thing is much more complex. That you know how do you change perceptions of people uh, in cities like Ahmedabad and it exists in other places where there's a communal or you know a, a caste based divide where people are people you know, uh, really discriminate in terms of um, if you eat meat or if you don't eat meat. Now, a very surprising thing is you don't see these problems uh, with uh, in commercial spaces. So, you know, you might get the strictest of Jain working, you know, having no problem uh, working in a complex where next to his office, somebody is eating non-vegetarian, you know, but why does that exist in homes? So is that our mixed use developments of a much larger scale? The answer, because when you make very, very small developments of 80 houses or hundred houses, 200 houses, these things start getting into play. But if you have larger developments, which have a significant amount of commercial activity, maybe you are trying to, you know, uh, reduce this impact and mixed use developments might also address this whole issue of vacancy. 
uh, in some ways because you know you have more commercial activity present there, uh, which would create more demand. Thanks, thanks, Naval. I think some an overarching um, perspective that we've taken is looking at public-private partnerships. Uh, for reducing vacancy and closing the gap. Uh, I have a few questions. One question each to each of the panelists. Um, um, David, uh, would you like, you, you said that you'd like to maybe put in a global perspective to what David, is, uh, to what Naval is saying. So go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Daval described a half a dozen ways where you look at the eight steps in the supply side value chain, land, trunk, infrastructure, design, layout, construction, risk assumption, um, offtake management. And at each stage, almost every one of those stages, government takes a slice, directly or indirectly. It can be stamp duty, it can be VAT, it can be sales tax. Uh, additionally, when it comes to development finance, you were making reference to development finance, um, most countries use a supply side development lending program, either direct government lending or a subsidized government loan. What Deval was trying to accomplish by getting direct access to PSL rather than bank plus up interest rates on the PSL. The third thing I would call your attention to as an important divide is the big developer versus small landlord, small owner exercise. Far and away, the best means to motivate small owners if they are formal developers, in other words, if they have formal income, is with a tax credit. Not a reduction of tax rate, but an actual rebate, rupee for rupee, against some quantum of the development cost. That can be paid to the household upon delivery of the unit, sale of the unit, rental at a certain price, so on and so forth. It's nice because it's not tax complex. And as Daval said, it's foregone revenue. So Anil, from the public's perspective, you don't put it in the appropriation cycle. It's a tax expenditure, which means it's easier to get in. It's counter cyclical. It does not get cut in budget cuts. And best of all, it's self-adjusting. The government only pays it when there's a lot of development. Well, when there's a lot of development, the government's getting tax on everything else and the tax credit to the developer is net savings. So every GAO study I've ever seen has said tax credits work better than appropriated funds for trying to drive this stuff forward. So you have a lot of the kernels of ideas that have proven themselves in other contexts here. Good work. Thanks, thank you. Uh, Zishan, um, firstly, any comments from you on solutions? Uh, any solutions which I think, you know, Dhaval missed out and you're burning to share uh, maybe your top three suggestions. And I also wanted to, uh, you know, ask you to share. You recently moved to Ahmedabad. You were looking for a house to stay in. There were so many houses which were, you know, vacant. Uh, you sh but then you also faced you know, problems finding a house. Uh, what were some of you, if you would like to share, you know, your personal experience and what you drew out of that? Uh, I was so happy that uh, I also mentioned uh, the problem of uh, having non veg yes. or uh, belonging to a particular caste or religion. So I faced a lot of problems regarding this. Everyone wants uh, to have a home uh, as near as possible to the workplace. So I tried the same and I faced so many problems and in the end I had to decide that I should go back uh, to a place where I can get the home easily. And the problems as mentioned by the Dhawal that uh, the, I, I was uh, belonging to a particular uh, community or I have uh, the non-veg non, non uh, food habit. So, I mean, in every society they... In Ahmedabad it was a big deal, right? Like a single person cannot get a house and that too. Yes, 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 yes sir. Yeah, uh, if you're single, you're a bachelor, you may have a problem in every uh, city of part. I mean, if you go Mumbai, Bangalore or Hyderabad, I mean, you may have uh, that problem. But uh, having at this stage, I mean, if you are an assistant, pro an assistant professor and uh, somebody is not going to, you know, give you the, the, the house to the rent just because you uh, have the non -wage. So that was a bit shocking. Uh, but uh, in the end, I had to decide that I will have to go that area where... Uh, uh, a, a particular community dominates where I can get the home uh, easily. And this is what happened actually. Yeah. Uh, other than the solutions I would mention, I mean, we all have to agree that we need solutions at the local level. And to provide the constructive solutions, uh, I mean, we need a lot of information at, for, for that particular area. I mean, the solutions we have discussed, uh, maybe for the Ahmedabad, 
may or may not be you know uh, uh, applicable for for the other cities of uh, india which may or may have uh, the same characteristics as ahmedabad has but still that the, those solutions uh, may not be applicable so uh, i mean we need the uh, the proper information or the large amount of information though we live in a world where data is the buzzword but when it comes to the data for the vacant houses which is essential for the effective policy making uh, unfortunately india is not the exception and india is remarkably poor uh, but i'm sorry to say that but uh, uh, our policies are uh, i believe our policies are often made in the dark we don't know whether the policies employed are in the right direction or not and we cannot examine the efficacy of those who choose to implement those policies and i believe that the availability of the data accuracy of that data and timeliness of the data because if data is not available within the reasonable time it loses its importance and the dissemination of uh, data are the key areas where the government needs to intervene like like they intervene in other uh, sector uh, with the help of uh, nsso data and uh, with the help of ministry of statistical and uh, uh, planning implementations uh, and so so that the other researchers can exploit the data and decompose the information and yeah. provide you the solution at the local level so i yeah. i think that that is the important sector that uh, Uh, we need to focus thank you zishan for sharing your personal story and also the importance of gathering data and then dissemination of data anil uh, you know we did a ton of work where you helped in by bringing in uh, funds from the private sector um, you know all, all our uh, the, the work that we've done together uh, for building over temporary uh, hospitals you brought in private partners what however what strikes me is that it all of it was philanthropic money it was csr money and uh, as we've seen in the first quarter earnings of the companies which have reported uh, there is uh, a 24% of the companies which have reported are in losses already so which means that the mandated csr uh, spending will also be you know will also come down now in the light of this when during a crisis when you need philanthropic money the most that is when csr money decreases are there can we think of other ways of partnering with private the private sector beyond csr because clearly csr is not very sustainable um uh, thank you again so now uh, so the uh, so what we did the task which we did uh, it was one of those very specific um scenarios where uh, like people from the private sector government etc like brought together to like fill a particular gap during the covid times but generally if we are just talking about the housing problem that we are having like um, even if we are looking at the most conservative of numbers we are still looking at a deficit of almost 20 million houses that's what we are seeing and there is a very massive number and when it comes to numbers like this personally i do feel that um, a lot of problems will need a lot of government intervention or else it cannot be solved and there have been efforts to do that for quite some time uh, like for example uh, for the last 20 odd years like we have something called a uh, pm uh, prime minister's housing scheme which is for low, low cost housing similarly a lot of uh, states almost every state in this country they also have their own uh low cost housing schemes the last one which was announced was just like i think one week back in andhra pradesh which is called i think ysr uh housing scheme or something like that and uh just for that one specific state i think almost 4000 crores have been allotted for this financial year and almost 25 lakh new houses have been created so a lot of things that large scales are happening and um uh and sometime and you are talking about this these are all like 1 lakh and 1 and a half and now now with prefab construction and a lot of advancements that is happening it is possible to create houses for this particular population segment for very low amounts like 2 lakhs and 3 lakhs and so on so that is the only way to bridge this large gap that we are having and if you are looking at the previous census is also like there is progress like for example the 2011 census it's 
says that currently we have 78 million houses and there had been a jump from 56 to 78 in something like 10 years. So we are making progress, but still there is a huge gap. Else, like, so that is one thing. And then the other um, area is like, for wherever you are, like whichever population segment you are in, like some basic policy changes can make things more easier. Like for example, if you are somebody who is trying to get your first house, you can make certain policies which can make purchasing your first house more easier, like making credit more easy, easily available or decreasing the stamp duties or these kind of things. So all those can once again make it easier to purchase at least your first house. Plus, uh, like again, what we discussed during the discussion, like there are quite a lot of vacant spaces everywhere, but because of many reasons they are not used. And the other is like they are not even properly mapped. So supply and demand is not really uh, matched. So a lot of technology that is coming up, including digitization and recording, etc., will help us reach this supply and demand problem. So like that, I think we could solve some of those issues immediately and some will take time. I think we are on the right track. Thank, thank you, Anil. Uh, David, uh, we have a question here about, um, you know, community voices uh, not being included enough in designing and developing uh, affordable housing projects um, and bringing in uh, PPP models. Um, would you have in mind any example, you know, internationally, where which have taken into account community voices, which uh, address issues that Zishan faced and uh, which also then intelligently, smartly bring in a PPP model which goes beyond uh, philanthropy? Short answers are twofold. Uh, first of all, it's very hard because uh, housing delivery and housing finance are extremely complicated subjects where there's an awful lot of jargon and concepts so that when you work directly with communities, they don't understand that stuff. And this is not their fault. It takes a lot of learning to get it. We, for our part, forget how to speak normal to communities like that. The most successful initiatives I've seen have, my, my favorite is Cody in Thailand, Cody mm -hmm. and the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, because they've shown the best ability to have a genuinely collaborative process of land rationalization and land enumeration and replatting. And Zishan, to go back to your data collection point, we were talking way back an hour ago about focus groups. Those processes happen only when trust has already been created. Because if, you, if, if those people do not trust you, they will not tell you the truth. And what will go into your system will be quantitative falsehood that you don't know is false. So you have to start, I talked before about inverting the problem between vacant houses and unhoused people. In certain ways, you have to start by inverting your decision pyramid from what can we afford, rather to go ask people what they want. Now asking them what they want is tricky because unless you put a price tag on things, they want, they want to put a house of 100 square meters, you know, in uh, the Leuchens Villas in Delhi, right? Everybody wants the same thing. We all want the same thing. So, the, so there is a process, a long process of engagement. I mean, and, and it takes a long time and, and, and bureaucracies get impatient when they face the long time. So I have seen many community engagement strategies that started out good and ended up bad because time collapsed. The other thing I would strongly suggest you do, you talked about CSR. Mm -hmm. How about in-kind CSR? How about where the top drawer law firms and the banks and the accounting firms and the universities, okay, have a moral obligation to put five to 10% of the FTE capacity for work pro bono for the disadvantaged who, and learn how to speak in their vernacular. For, for my sins, 
I have for the last three and three quarter years been the financial advisor to the public housing tenants of one of the poorest complexes in New England. It's on Bunker Hill, it's 1100 units. The whole thing is gonna be demolished and rebuilt into a 1.6, $1.5 billion, 2700 unit complex. So it's exactly what you'd want, 1100, you know, derelict stuff comes down, 2,700 goes up, the people move out, the people move back. If it works, it'll be fantastic. Three and three quarter years of development approval. And I spent the whole time advising and working with the tenants. And I've learned two things here, Zeeshan, in this whole thing. One, don't tell them what to want. Make sure you hear what they want and then you tell them how to trade, what, what the trade-offs are among the things that they want, okay? That's the first one. And second one is if you ha cannot explain it in their vernacular, you will fail. Do, you know, you can explain some of your jargon, but it must be in their vernacular. And one part of their vernacular is if I say no, is it no? If the answer is if you say no, well, it's not exactly no, we'll come back and ask you again. That's not a consultation. That's consultation theater because we're going to do what we want anyway. This is really hard. I am terrible at it. But, but for my karmic sins, I'm, I've got three and three quarter years learning how to be less terrible at it. You have to treat them like they're smart and underpowered. And you have to respect that they want what they want and they're allowed to say no. Thank you, David. That was a really, that was a very rich discussion. Um, I really like the innovative um, you know, ways of engaging the private sector, point well taken, in-kind CSR. I think that's something that I haven't heard of before. That's really interesting. Uh, so there's the private sector, but there is also policy, right? Policy plays a huge role in uh, affordable housing, especially. And uh, yeah, you know, we're coming to the end of the webinar of this, dis this discussion on, um, and uh, I would like to play a little game where we'll be looking at policy. Um, let's say that you, you have a minute with uh, the Prime Minister of India. What is the one request that you would make from him to house the unhoused in India? Um, Anil, do you want to go first? I think Could you repeat that question once again, if I have one minute, what I'm what You have one minute with the Prime Minister of India. Mm -hmm. And if there is and you have a, and if there is one thing that you can ask him a solution if you want to offer to him to house the unhoused people in India, what would that be? That one solution, what is it that you would offer? Like I previously mentioned, we already have a lot of plans in place, but I think we are all struggling with the execution of those plans. So, yes. Uh, I think we need um, so I think that will be where I'd be stressing to like create more practical and executionable plans, which where we need to see the results on the ground. Thanks, Anna. That's the elephant in the room. India, since independence, we've been great at making very progressive policies, but the implementation out of it is always a big question mark. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, thank you for that. Uh, Dhawal, your one minute with uh, PM. My one thing would be just make rental possible in India. I think all our, a lot of our problems will go away if we actually get people to, uh, you know, make it possible to create rental stock because all the demand that we say in India is not for people to own homes. It's for people to rent as well. And that would be the only thing, you know, I think that's the, that's the key uh, for solving most of the problems. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Saval. And in fact, uh, in our report, all our viewers, you can take a look at the report. We have a considerable section on um, solutions related to 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 to, to, to rental, um, which uh, you know, which you can read. Uh, thanks, um, Zishan. Yeah, I'll discuss with him that, uh, sir. We know that uh, 
fixing up and they reuse the vacant buildings and providing uh, the home to the unhomed uh, unhoused uh, it's difficult but uh, please uh, please uh, you know start uh, uh, nss kind of uh, data rounds so, so that we have the proper information of a vacant houses and why they are vacant so that uh, we can try to minimize uh, the the gap between the requirements of the houses and uh, and and the reasons for the uh, the vacant houses so that we can come up to some sort of equilibrium where the demand and supply will match to each other yeah great thank you david your one minute with pm modi it's two parts on the same idea they both both relate to freeing up blocked urban land mm -hmm. idea number 1 amnesty from gain taxation on the rezoning of land that has become urban but is still zoned agricultural and the second one is enabling slum dwellers in collective groups to gain a homestead right to acquire the land on which their slums sit for one rupee. If you could draw a circle around all of Dharavi and give it to the slum dwellers as a body, so they have free and clear title now, they then gain leverage Zishan and they could lever that into a whole boatload of money because the paradox of slums this is not part of my prime minister's commentary. The paradox of slums is that you have very low actual human density and high human misery because you're stuck at one and two stories. And if you redevelop them and go vertical, you can put more people on the same hectares at higher density with higher quality and higher value. So you liberate the land by doing a big bang land transfer to the slum dwellers and a waiver of tax on that. It's a double foregone revenue. And all of a sudden they would be the most popular people in India because now you would have some of the best land in India to redevelop. Cut the Gordian knot. Thank you. Um, I'm sure Dhabal would have some comments on that on going vertical, uh, but we'll keep that for another, for another discussion. Uh, but thank you so much. I just wanted to thank everybody on the panel as well as all our viewers. Thank you. That was, that was very interesting. We, met, we went from very local problems to looking at national level problems, bringing in an international perspective, moved to solutions, looking at PPP models, some new innovative stuff coming in. Uh, we, the Anand Center for Sustainability, it's a think, teach, and do tank. So uh, all the research that we do, we, we, you know, we go ahead and implement it as well. Uh, so the find some of the ideas from this webinar, uh, and the other discussions that we'll be having around the report, we would be taking it up uh, to implement. And hopefully people like Anil, uh, friends like Anil, um, you know, would, uh, would help us and others in the private sector who have supported us um, would help as well. Uh, to all our viewers, uh, feel free to write in um, to us. Um, I'll type out other suggestions. If you would like a copy of the report, uh, we're happy to uh, provide that. Um, and uh, it would also be about an international university. Has a huge focus on sustainability. So uh, thank you so much and uh, have a good uh, evening. Have a good day, David. Um, and, you know, thank you so much for, the, for your time. And vote of thanks to the moderator and the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.